Well, hi there, and welcome to our Bible study on 1 Corinthians on the Lighthouse Discord server. We're going to be talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 7 on marriage, which is a tough message, to be honest with you. What uh, chapter 6 really was all about was uh, breaking those vows. It was all about sexual immorality, which is also a very difficult topic of conversation. But before we begin this study, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we give you thanks and praise, glory and honor <clears throat> that no matter what we're going through in our lives, no matter what our marriages or relationships are like or friendships, no matter what our walk with you is like, we know that we know that we know that you see it all, you know it all, and that when we're struggling, we can go to you. We can lay it at the altar and you will take the burdens and deal with them. Jesus, you are the light of the world. And God, you're the source of that light. And so I ask that you would fill us all with your Holy Spirit presence as we study your word i pray god for every need represented on the server whether it's a member whether it's a family member of a member or a friend or some other prayer request that we know about there's many 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 needs out there but may we all turn to you for the answer fill us with your Holy Spirit presence. Help us to be completely transformed, washed new in the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask, Lord, that everything that's said and done in our study today would be a fragrant offering of blessing to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So before we read this chapter, I'd like to share the introduction, and I think it's important. You see, we've now come to a major division in this epistle, this letter of 1 Corinthians. You see, in the first six chapters, the Apostle Paul confronted the Corinthian church about some of the many compromises in the church. And he did this based upon the disturbing report that he received concerning their carnality. The report was in 1 Corinthians 1.11, and he addressed carnality in 1 Corinthians 3.1. So at this point... You know, we might be thinking that there was little hope for the church in Corinth. I mean, it was a cesspool in a lot of ways. But granted, the challenges faced by the members of that congregation might have seemed insurmountable, but all was not lost. And I think that's really important for us to know today. See, they had some good things going for them. They had access to their founding apostle and all of the apostolic wisdom that Paul brought to the table. And <clears throat> secondly, and probably equally as important, is that they were teachable. To their credit, they sought Paul's advice about a wide-ranging assortment of subjects. Relating that to us today, you know, we may make mistakes, we may sin, we may struggle in our walk with God, but if we remain teachable, we still have the opportunity to learn. When we harden our hearts, when we stop listening, when we stop paying attention to what God has to say to us, well, that becomes the problem. So beginning now with chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians, Paul answers 
a series of questions that they asked actually via letter, a letter that they had written to him, most likely delivered to Paul in Ephesus by Stephanus. This is actually talked about in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now, the letter went, excuse me, by Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Icaeus, according to 1 Corinthians 16, 17. And their questions dealt with many different topics. From relationships, to proper behavior at the Lord's Supper, from so-called gray areas to spiritual gifts, from wearing head coverings to the resurrection. So Paul doesn't repeat the questions in his letter back to them, but we can deduce the nature of each question from the answers that he gave. Their questions and Paul's answers evidence a confusion that actually existed among the members of the church and their desire to receive the apostles' instructions. Now, the first series of questions had to do with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Unfortunately, marriages were a mess in Corinth. And we now have enough background information from the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians to understand why. Given the cesspool from which these believers were washed, sanctified, and justified, which, by the way, included widespread fornication, adultery, and homosexuality, we shouldn't be surprised to learn that trying to bring order out of these crazy lifestyles was like trying to unscramble an egg. Ever tried to do that? Many, if not most, of these Christians had made omelets out of their personal lives, not unlike many dear people in our churches today. Now, I'm not going to get into it all, but I will tell you that I made a mess of my earlier life. Not even intentionally, it just kind of happened. Choices I made, people I got involved with, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? God can take that mess and turn it into something beautiful. He can even take our scrambled eggs and turn it into a beautiful omelet if we stop stirring and let him do the work. Now, a lot of people I know don't like Beth Moore, but I do appreciate what she says here. Can you think of any need you might have that would require more strength than God exercise to raise the dead? Me either. God can raise marriages from the dead and he can restore life and purpose to those who have given up. He can forgive and purify the vilest sinner. You have no need that exceeds his power. Faith is God's favorite invitation to RSVP with proof. You see, some in the church had been married, divorced, and remarried multiple times. Honestly, that's my story. But there's also many people in our churches today who have gone through the same things. And some were living together outside of marriage. And others concluded that the best way to be spiritual was to forfeit sexual pleasure altogether and become celibate for the rest of their lives. You see, the problem was the Corinthian church did not know where the lines were drawn. So it's not surprising then that Paul devotes a full 40 verses to the subjects of singleness, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Because their questions came fast and furious. Is it better to be married or single? If I'm divorced, can I remarry? If I'm married to an unbeliever who is involved in adultery or homosexuality, should I stay married to him or leave him? And friends, I just want to warn you, if you're hearing a noise in the background, it's our young cat who's just going wild. Sometimes she does that, and she always picks Bible study for whatever reason. So 
if you want to look at it this way, there isn't much to applaud the Corinthians for. But I'll give them this. This is what our commentator says. They apparently wanted to do the right thing. And so they turned to Paul, their father in faith, to find out what the right thing was. So Paul was writing a letter here. He wasn't writing a handbook on how to have a happy marriage. And so his letter or epistle sounds a lot more like a conversational mode of communication than a tightly outlined manuscript. But in some places he went on tangents. So, you know, he wrote it almost like we were meeting him for coffee at Starbucks or something, for example. So just so you understand as we get into it, what it's really like. So let's have a look. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry, at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm reading from the NASB. It is a bit long. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, each man, he is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another, except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession, not of command. Yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Excuse me, but I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I. But if they do not have self control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But to the married, I give instructions not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife? whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct in all the churches. Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called? In uncircumcision, he is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. An uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is the keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Don't worry about it. But if you are able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called 
in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Now, Concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who, by the mercy of the Lord, is trustworthy. I think, then, that this is good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned, yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they do not, did not possess. And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world for how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she has passed her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart, to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So then, both he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the spirit of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Those are some pretty harsh words. Or one could take it that way. So verse one. Excuse me. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, that might seem like a strange statement to us. What does it mean exactly? But it had a familiar ring to anyone familiar with the Old Testament. And we first encounter the phraseology, actually, in Genesis 20, verse 6, where we read of Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Here, history repeated itself as far as Abraham was concerned. 25 years earlier, while in Egypt, Abraham had lied to Pharaoh about his wife, Sarah, in a foolish attempt to save his skin while placing her at considerable risk by telling the monarch that Sarah was his sister. That happened in Genesis 12, verse 19. And even though Abraham left Egypt in disgrace because of this lie, 25 years later, he once again told the same lie to Abimelech. And in a dream, God command or commanded Abimelech for acting with integrity toward Abraham's wife, instructed him to remove Sarah from his harem 
and to return her to Abraham and pointed out that he protected Sarah when he did not let Abimelech touch her in Genesis 20, verse 6. And the same term is used in Ruth 2, 9, when Boaz invited Ruth to get to uh, glean in his field, he assured her of his protection when he said, have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And then Proverbs 6, verses 28 to 29 provides us with the clearest understanding of this phrase. Solomon asked, can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. So Paul here actually begins chapter 7, where he left off in chapter 8. He again called the Corinthian church to sexual purity. And he commanded the man not to touch a woman in a sexually intimate manner outside of marriage. Now, it's interesting and that as far as I know, I'm the only female in the voice chat leading the study and there's men. So I'm sorry about that. But this is what God's called me to do. And this is the word of the Lord. So in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 2 to 9, the big picture is, that Paul emphasized that sexual temptation is extremely difficult to resist. Now, if you were me on the server or in active ministry as staff, you would know how prevalent that is because people ask constantly for prayer about this very thing. And that's why we have our anti-lewdness channel with a bunch of resources from Pure Life Ministry. But you see, for this reason, Paul affirmed marriage as the one legitimate man-woman relationship wherein sexual needs can and must be met. And he gave his readers a number of guidelines regarding the role of sex in marriage and the responsibilities of husbands and wives to one another regarding each other's sexual needs. Now, as we've noted, God saved a good number of the Corinthian Christians out of a lifestyle of sexual impurity. So as a result of that, many were confused about how to live a pure life. Precisely because of the sheer power of sexual temptation, Paul placed his apostolic rubber stamp on marriage as a good thing a needed thing. And in a sense, he gave his pastoral permission to his unmarried readers to get married when he said, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But Let's not think for one minute that Paul reduced marriage to nothing more than an outlet for sexual desire. Because in other passages, like Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, Paul used the love of a husband for his wife as a metaphor for God's love of the church. Paul extolled the virtues of marriage as so much more than just a sexual relationship. But in Corinth, Immorality in all of its perverted forms ruled the day. And so this is basically where he sat down and talked turkey with them about marriage in the context of sexual purity. Now, for anyone who doesn't know this, sexual temptation goes beyond physical desire. There is a spiritual component to it. And Satan, good old Satan, I tell you, God will love him. And I'm being sarcastic. He understands how powerful the urge to impurity can be. And he exploits it as a human weakness. 
So Paul warns his readers that every husband, excuse me, has a duty to his wife and every wife a duty to her husband. And that duty is to satisfy the desires of the other. Lest Satan take advantage of their human weaknesses and tempt one or both into making some bad choices with disastrous consequences. See, we should derive much comfort from the fact that Paul specifically and the biblical writers generally understood the nature of human weakness. The Bible clearly stipulates that we humans lack self-control in a variety of areas, not just in this one. We err in our thinking when we wrongly conclude that a spiritual person should somehow be above fleshly desires, whether they be sexual or otherwise. Isn't that interesting? Because it's true. We're human. We're saved by the grace of God. Absolutely no doubt about it. But we're human. So when Jesus' disciples couldn't keep from falling asleep just Prior to his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, he warned them, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said this in Matthew 26, 41. So just as our flesh is weak, so is ours. Now, it may be shocking, to some that Paul would speak in such frank terms about this. It's not really the kind of thing that one might expect to come pouring out of an apostle's pen. But the problem is, is it's right where many of us live. And it, it's the same for the Christians in Corinth. I don't know about you. But I've met a lot of pastors in my lifetime. And there's some who I can tell you don't deal very well with controversy. They don't deal well with difficult statements. Paul, on the other hand, he didn't seem to have a problem. He dealt with whatever the need was at the time. So what we need to understand here is that the sexual union between a husband and his wife is the most beautiful, intimate, pleasurable, bond-building expression of love between two people. But on a purely pragmatic level, different people have different degrees of needs in this area. And one aspect of selfless love that makes for a good marriage involves one marriage partner giving more of him or herself to his or her mate in recognition of and with a desire to meet those needs. So when a husband or wife willingly deprives his or her spouse of having that need met, then he opens up or she opens up the other to a satanic temptation because of your lack of self-control, according to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 5. The Bible can't get much more practical than that. So we know there's value to being single. But there's also value to being married. So it now becomes a matter of what does God call us to do? So Paul tackles two questions. He says, what about divorce and remarriage between two Christians? And what about divorce and remarriage when a Christian is married to an unbeliever? Well, before we look at the answer, let's look at this. Paul is stating God's will, God's best in each situation. Paul set a high standard for marriage, and rightly so, especially giving given, sorry, the cavalier attitude that many of the Corinthians had toward marriage. See, marriage as God defined it in Genesis 2.24 
was in short supply in Corinth. And some of Paul's answers might have seemed unrealistic given the deplorable state of marriage in the seaport city. Some of his answers might seem unrealistic to us at a time when in our own society, here we are debating what the definition of marriage is. Nevertheless, what we read in the remainder of the chapter clearly expresses God's will concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. So in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 to 11, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me, a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. You see, Paul reinforced the principle of marriage, a command that Jesus had already addressed, namely that the word divorce has no place in a Christian's lexicon. Jesus put it this way. Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they're no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separated, Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. So by reaching all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Jesus affirmed that from the very beginnings of the human race, God designed marriage to be a committed, monogamous, heterosexual, that's male and female, union that lasts for as long as they both live. And Paul reiterated this standard by categorically stating a husband is not to divorce his wife. Now, in that culture, the husband initiated the divorce and not the wife. And you might remember that when Joseph discovered that his betrothed Mary was pregnant, not wanting to make her a public example, Joseph was minded to put her away secretly in Matthew 1, 19. Now, <clears throat> I don't know how all of you feel about marriage. I don't know how you feel about divorce. And this is not intended to hurt anyone. It's not intended to bring anybody down. But I've been married and I've been divorced. And in fact, the reason that I left was abuse. And I made the mistake of marrying two different men at two different times who were abusive. I've gone back now and I've apologized to both of them for my part in what happened. But in the case of the second one, for sure, I actually, I left for my safety and got myself set up in a place. And I actually went back to meet with him and tried to reconcile because I did not want to have another divorce. And he told me that he had found the apple of his eye. So he wanted me to file for divorce. So yeah, that's my experience he couldn't afford to do it but he definitely did not want me back what do you do in that situation does that make me less of a christian some would say so for sure but i know where god took me so paul wrote to a church in that culture but if he wrote today he would surely state the principle a husband is not to divorce his wife nor is the wife to divorce her husband so what do you do in the case of abuse very tough decision 
So according to Malachi 2.16, the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. And we don't need a PhD in clinical psychology to understand why. No one comes through a divorce unscarred. Not the husband, not the wife, or the children, if there are any. The collateral damage from every divorce is incalculable. Divorce not only destroys family, it tears at the very fabric of society. So when God designed marriage and created the family, he did so with the intention that marriages last a lifetime. So we could be thinking, but didn't Jesus permit divorce when the husband or wife committed adultery? So if so, why doesn't that mean that it's okay for a Christian to get a divorce? Well, yes and no. And that was talked about in Matthew 19, verse 9. You see, Jesus permitted divorce in the case of adultery. So when someone joins himself sexually to another, he or she has, by that adulterous act, shattered the marriage vow. The divorce doesn't shatter the marriage. The adultery does. But even though Jesus permitted divorce in that situation, he did not command divorce. And he certainly did not approve of it. There's many things that God permits to happen, even though he does not approve of them. In that sense, there's no thing as a biblical divorce, a divorce of which God approves, adultery notwithstanding. The disciples clearly understood the sky-high standard that Jesus set for marriage and so replied, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Matthew 19, 10. In other words, at the very least, marriage is not to be entered into lightly. This is tough stuff. I get it. Kevin Lehman wrote, Wives, your relationship with your husband must be your greatest concern. In modern times, we are sold such a bill of goods by experts who tell us marriage is a 50-50 proposition. It has to be 100, 100. We don't just go halfway, but put our spouse's needs ahead of our own. You see, as far as Paul was concerned, divorce is not or was not an option, but separation is. So if a wife chooses to divorce, or sorry, to depart from her husband, or a husband depart from his wife, she is to remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and vice versa. They are to remain unmarried lest they commit adultery. The fact that we are talking here about separation and not divorce is indicated by Paul's use of a word translated depart that is different from the one he used for divorce. Paul also spoke of the separation as temporary in that he held out the hope that the husband and wife would eventually be reconciled. See, God designed marriage to be a committed, monogamous, lifelong union of a husband and a wife. That's the standard the church is to hold out to society. And that's the standard most parents would like to hold out to their children. No reasonable parent would want a son or daughter to experience the pain or bear the scars of divorce. That being said, divorces do happen. When they do, it's incumbent upon a church to become a redemptive community of caring Christians who lavish upon a repentant divorce the love and support he or she needs in order to rebuild their lives. Divorce is not a scarlet sin. Divorced individuals should not be ostracized, degraded, or made to feel as though they are second-class Christians. God forgives divorce, and so should we. Bill and Lynn Hybels wrote, In the covenant of marriage, God asks two self-willed sinners to come together and become one flesh, not in body only, but in spirit, in attitude, in communication, in love. Think about the implications. Imagine two self-willed sinners trying to submit to one another as God calls them to do. That will take a decade. 
Or imagine two self-willed sinners trying to serve one another joyfully. Another decade. It's a lifetime of challenge. Perhaps the greatest, the single greatest challenge there is. So this is a very long study. I think what we'll do is end it here for today. And we'll be going on to living with an unbelieving spouse next time. And uh, let's close in a word of prayer. And if anyone has any comments or questions, feel free. I try not to share too much of my own life in these studies, but this hits me pretty hard as well as it may hit some of you. Dear Jesus, <clears throat> I don't know what everyone's situation is. I don't know how many people are married or divorced or contemplating divorce or contemplating marriage on the server. I know there are quite a few married couples. And I know that our churches teach different things. And I know, Lord God, that some are adamant that divorce should never happen and others are more okay with it lord but we know what your word says and so i pray lord god that as we contemplate marriage in our future as we look at our own marriages and what might be going on in our lives you know we might look at our pasts or our future i pray lord that you would be in all of it I know for me, Lord, I got on my knees before you and I prayed and I had to seek forgiveness for every part of what I did wrong and that my choices affected my decision. I didn't seek you. But I know, Lord, what I need to do now. And so I ask for your hand of mercy and grace upon all of us, upon all who are either married or contemplating marriage. And I ask God that you would help us to grow stronger in our relationship with you. Thank you for who you are and for setting the prime example for all of us. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen.